Hello and welcome to this keynote from Java 17 to 21, where I am going to talk to you about what you will see in the upcoming versions of the JDK developed under the project Amber, Loom, Valhalla, and Panama. My name is Jose. I am a Java developer advocate at the Java Platform Group here at Oracle. Here are some links with the content I publish on the web. And if you're interested in more Java content, you can follow one of these links, including following me on Twitter. You have some code on my GitHub account, videos on YouTube, including on the Java channel, and slides on my Slashare account. And here are some more links with the content we publish at the Java Platform Group. There are videos with the Java newscast held by my friend Nikolai, the weekly sip of Java by my friend Billy, and the Inside Java podcast in case you don't like videos, which is fine. And of course, the dev.java website with all the documentation you need on the Java language. Just before we start, I would like to talk to you about OpenJDK, which is in fact the place where you need to go or you need to connect to if you're looking for information about what is currently being developed in Java. This is the place where it all happens and all the projects we are going to talk about have a page, a mailing list and sometimes an early access distribution available here. The link is jdkjava.net. You can download several JDK builds from the OpenJDK, including builds for experimental branches. So if you want to try the new features developed as part of the Valhalla project, for instance, you can do so from this page. Why is this talk called From Java 17 to 21 and not 23, for instance? Well, as you know, the JDK 17 is the last LTS release of the Java platform. And because companies like LTS releases, odds are that this is the version you are currently working with, or that you are going to work with sooner or later. Sooner would be better. At the same time the JDK 17 was released, the LTS cadence went from one every three years to one every two years, meaning that the next LTS is 21 in one year and not 23 in two years. And along with that, the Oracle license for these new releases is now the NFTC license, the Oracle No Fee Terms and Condition license. Of course, you need to check this license carefully, but this license for the Oracle JDK subject to the conditions, permits free use for all users, even commercial and production use. Redistribution is permitted as long as it is not for a fee. Oracle provided these free releases on updates, starting with Oracle JDK 17, and continue for one full year after the next LTS release. Meaning that once the JDK 21 is there, you will have one year to upgrade from 17 to 21 with the same license. You may be thinking that having a version every six months or an LTS version every two years slows down the release cadence of the feature added to the JDK. Well, here is a chart that shows you the contrary. In fact, the number of features released per year is increasing. So making the cadence faster brings you these features faster with no drawback. By the way, here is a list of the new features from the JDK 8 to the JDK 17. Moving from 8 to 17 brings you many free things, among them free performances. Using the new garbage collectors will speed up your application without having to recompile it. Without deep diving in the details, this compact string and indify string concatenation features makes your string processing consume less memory and run faster. This is also free performance for you. There are things coming to the JDK that will change both the way you write Java code and the way you organize your applications 
if you are an architect. Amber is about pattern matching. Pattern matching is nothing but new, but the impact it will have on the code you write will be equivalent to the impact of lambda expressions or generics in Java 5. Better and safer code for better performances. Loom is about concurrent programming. Currently, the technique you use to increase the throughput of your application is to use asynchronous code. It leads to code that is complex to write, hard to read, hard to test, hard to debug, and impossible to profile. When Loom becomes a feature of the JDK, you will not need to write asynchronous code anymore. Your code will be much more readable and you will have better performances. Valhalla is about user-defined primitive types. Why is your application using instances of string instead of instances of city objects wrapping strings of character? Because wrapping technical objects with business objects adds a level of indirection that is pointer chasing. It is costly. Valhalla is just about that, not having to choose performances over readability anymore. Again, cleaner code, better performances. And at last, Panama is twofold. First, its goal is to bring support for the SIMD instructions you have in your CPU and to make them available in Java. And second, it is about redesigning the foreign functions and foreign data access through the JDK. So what you are really going to see is how is Java going to evolve in the next few years to bring better performances, to help you developer write cleaner code, and to help you as an architect to organize your application in a better way. Before we really start, there is one feature that didn't quite fit anywhere, so let me move it out of the way right now. The finalized method has been deprecated for removal, starting with the JDK 18. So stop overriding finalize. Most of the time, the code you put in this method is either useless or buggy or both. So stop doing that. So let us start with the project Amber. The first thing I would like to cover is this notion of records. A record is a class that is meant to carry an aggregate of immutable data. You can see a record as a named tuple. Everything has a name in Java. This is how Java has been created, so tuples have names. A record is built on components. On the example here, the record rectangle is built on two components, width and height. And these components also have names. The names of these components are important. A record is a class that is final, so you cannot extend a record. That being said, you can still implement any interface you need. And a class of a record extends itself a class named java.lang.record, so you cannot extend anything with a record. What does the compiler give you with a record? Well, it gives you many very useful things. The first one being a constructor. The canonical constructor is the constructor that simply takes the components of this record as a parameter. It is called the canonical constructor. It also gives you one accessor for each component you create. And by the way, these components are stored in immutable fields in your class, so you cannot change their value. And it also gives you a toString equals and hash code method. There are things that you cannot do with a record. You cannot add an instance field within a record. Static fields are OK, but not instance field. You cannot extend the record because it's a final class, and you cannot extend anything with a record because it already extends this record class. But implementing an interface is OK, and adding instance or static methods is also OK. If you're not happy with the elements the compiler gives you, you can write your own, for instance, the canonical constructor. Why would you want to write your own canonical constructor? On this example, I have written my own canonical constructor, mainly to perform some validations on the name. 
I do not want to build a user with a name that is new. The second reason you may want to write your own canonical constructor could be to do some defensive copy. If your record is built on elements that are mutable, doing some defensive copy will probably be needed. If what you need to do is only validation, then you can also write this canonical constructor in that way, without the parameters and without the copying of the arguments to the instance fields of these records. This way of writing the canonical constructor is called the compact constructor. And as you can see, it gives you a very easy to read pattern, a very clean pattern to declare both your record and its validation rules. To wrap things up about records, there are two golden rules you need to follow. First golden rule, a record cannot carry any other state than its component. So when you take a look at the declaration of a record, you immediately see all the state this record can carry. And second golden rule, a record cannot be built without calling its canonical constructor. And in fact, it's the only type of class in Java that gives you this guarantee because it's enforced even during the deserialization process. If you have a record that has been serialized and recreate this record instance out of this serialized version, then the canonical constructor will be called. You cannot avoid that. It makes record an excellent choice for data transport objects, for instance. Second element brought by Amber are the sealed types. What is a sealed type? Well, first, it's a type. So it can be an interface, a class, or an abstract class. Here, I'm showing you an interface, but it could really be something else. A sealed type is a type that knows all the allowed extension. Here, we have public sealed interface shape, and shape only allows square, rectangle, circled, and random shape to extend it as a type. Square, rectangle, circled, and random shape can be of any type, interface, classes, and abstract classes. An extension of a seal type must be declared in a very precise way. First, it can be final, and this is the case on this example, because we just saw that the record is in fact a final class, so that's okay. And the circle class is a regular class, so you need to declare it final explicitly. If you don't, you will get the compiler error telling you that you need to do that. It can be sealed itself, so here is this rectangle class, which is sealed, and this extended rectangle class is allowed to extend this rectangle class. And lastly, it can be any regular class that you can freely extend somewhere else. But because you want to avoid having a sealed hierarchy of types with an extension point that is there by accident, you need to declare explicitly that this random shape class is non-sealed with this non-sealed declaration in front of the declaration of the class. So no accidentally opened seal hierarchy. You need to declare this extension point explicitly. There is one constraint with seal types. Everything must be declared in the same package or in the same module if your application is built on modules. Again, two golden rules with seal types that you need to keep in mind. First, seal types are enforced at compile time and at runtime. So if you try to create extensions of a seal type at runtime with some kind of bytecode manipulation, the JVM will catch you. You will not be able to do that. And second, you cannot create extension points in a hierarchy of seal types by accident. You need to declare this explicitly. The third point I would like to cover from the Amber project is pattern matching. We've all been written this kind of code in our class, in our application. Check if some kind of random object is in fact an instance of a given type that we need to work with. Here it's user. Now, if it's a user, well, we have to explain that a second time to the JVM. Now that I know that this is a user, can I have a variable of type user created by casting this object? And then because users have names, we can call user.getName and do something with it. 
Great. Well, this was before. Because now we have this new feature added by Amber called Pattern Matching for Instance of. Now we, what we can do directly is say if always an instance of user and then add user there so that it creates a variable of type user automatically. And then we can call get name on this user object because it is just that, a user object. Now, you may be thinking that this is just syntactic sugar. That is nice, but well, just nice to have. It's in fact much more than that because this user user is in fact a pattern. User user is the declaration of the pattern. It gives the type of the pattern. Here it is a type pattern. It's the name of the pattern. And the user variable is called the binding variable for this pattern. A pattern can have more than one binding variable, and we are going to see examples of that. The O variable is the target operand of this instance of. It will try to match this target operand with the declaration of a variable on the right of this instance of. You can use this binding variable wherever it makes sense. So it's perfectly legal to write this kind of code. Then in the end of Boolean branch of this stuff, you can also use this variable and called get age directly on this instance. The next thing that is going to come in this field of pattern matching is the record pattern matching. It's a preview feature in the JDK 19. Instead of saying, oh, but it's always an instance of user, and then I create name by calling user.getName, I can directly create two binding variables, name and age. It looks like I am deconstructing this record. And it makes perfect sense to do that because I know that a record is built on components. When you look at the components of a record, you have all the internal states of this record. So this is just fine. But in fact, deconstruction is also something that is going to be extended to regular classes, either through constructors or through factory methods. And if you need the reference on the user object itself, you can also add it there. I'm not so sure that you really need it, but it's still a possibility. Next element is the switch expression that has been added by the Ember project, and that will benefit from pattern matching. Both type pattern matching and record pattern matching are going to be supported in switch expression. So suppose that we have a shape object called shape, and it allows only square and circles as extension. Then you can compute the surface of this shape just in that way by switching on this variable. This is new because previously you could only switch on primitive types, enumeration, and string of characters. Now you can also switch on types and use patterns as case labels. If the shape is a square, then you can just bind this binding variable to this shape. And same for circle. By the way, this little syntax with this little arrow is a switch expression. It is also something that you can use and that has been added as part of the project Ember. And you can see that you do not have any default clause in this switch. That's because this shape interface is sealed. So the compiler is able to see that all the cases have been covered. There is no possibility to have something else in this switch expression, which is in fact exhaustive written in this way. If you miss a case in your switch expression, the compiler will tell you and will give you an error because it's not legal to have a missing case. And this point is very useful because it also works if someone adds a permitted type in your shape hierarchy. Then when you recompile your code, the compiler will tell you that you forgot to support this new type in your switch expressions. Very useful for data-oriented programming. When we have record patterns, you will also be able to use them within switch expressions, which is the case if you activate the preview features of the JDK 19. Now, the future of pattern matching will bring many new features. We just barely scratched the surface. We should have array pattern matching, that is the possibility to define binding variables that are elements of an array and nest it with record pattern matching. Record pattern matching is about deconstructing records. And we know that they have been built on components, so it makes perfect sense. 
But you also have regular objects created using factory methods of regular constructors. The goal is to enable the deconstructions of these elements in the same way. So if you can build your circles or squares using this factory method, then what about matching circle and square instances in that way? This kind of pattern would work very well with optional, for instance. And in that case, note that the value cannot be null because an optional cannot wrap a null value. Neat. And what about using patterns in other places than instance of and switch? Like in a forage statement, for instance. That could also come in the future. A constant pattern is about combining a binding variable and a constant value. On this example, this pattern matches if the map contains the key name and the key email. And in that case, the name and email binding variables are just the values bound to this key. This is a very powerful syntax because in just one line of code, you check if both keys are in the map, and if they are, you extract the bound values. Imagine doing the same thing with a JSON object. Suppose you need to analyze this one with all these key value pairs. Well, with the right pattern methods, the right and pattern combiner that may appear in the future, and not with this ugly keyword, of course, analyzing all these JSON objects becomes just a one-liner with an instance of. Awesome. That was for the Amber project. Let us move now to the Loom project. The Loom project is about bringing a new model for concurrent programming to the Java platform. The first thing it is going to bring, and this is a preview feature of the JDK 19 released last September, is the notion of virtual threads. So what is a virtual thread? In a nutshell, it's a thread. So everything that is working very well with platform threads, like race conditions, visibility problems, locking, etc., is working exactly the same with virtual threads. The difference is really about performances. A platform thread takes about one millisecond to start because it is in fact an operating system thread. It consumes about two megabytes of memory and switching the context from one platform thread to the other takes about 200 microseconds, which is a lot. Virtual threads are much faster. It takes about one microsecond to start a virtual thread, so that's about 1,000 times faster. And the memory consumption is in the order of the kilobyte. And switching is also much faster, mainly because there is no real switching. Virtual threads could be seen as lightweight thread, carrying tasks which can be runnable or callable, just as usual, and running on top of regular platform threads. So how is this virtual thread being executed by a platform thread? When a virtual thread is blocked, then it will detect that. It could be waiting from some I.O. data, it could be blocked because of locking or synchronization, or it could be sleeping, for instance. When it is detected, this thread will be unmounted from this platform thread. What does it mean? It means that the stack associated to this virtual thread will be moved to the memory heap until the data is available or until it's awakened by the system. And at some point, when it's notified because there is something that is happening, then the portion of the stack of this virtual thread will be taken from the heap memory and moved back to a platform thread. It could be the same platform thread or, in fact, any other platform thread. So Loom works with a limited number of platform threads, does not need to have that many, does not need more than several platform threads. If you test the preview version of Loom, you will see that with nine platform threads, that's enough to run hundreds of thousands of virtual threads. The first thing that Loom is bringing you is that launching a virtual thread is very cheap. It's about one thousandth of the platform threads. Blocking a virtual thread is also very cheap. The price of blocking a virtual thread is the price of moving the stack to the heap back and forth. 
So it's not free, of course, nothing is ever free, but it's much cheaper than blocking a platform thread. And blocking a virtual thread does not block the platform thread. And in the meantime, the platform thread does not block, of course. It's free to execute any other virtual thread. So it will stay on this core of your CPU forever without any context switching. So why would you pull virtual threads? <laughs> well, don't do that. It's useless. You do not need to pull virtual threads because they are too cheap to be pulled. You can, in fact, test your application right now with virtual threads just by activating the preview features of the JDK 19. And then, uh, if you want to do that, you can use this factory method from the executors class that is going to create a virtual thread to run your task on demand. So that's a very simple way to refactor your concurrent application to test Loom if you want to do that. Now, the second part of Loom is called structured concurrency and it's available in the JDK 19 as an incubator API. As a developer, odds are that you are not going to interact directly with virtual threads. The idea of structured concurrency is really to bring you patterns of code that are bound to replace the asynchronous patterns you are currently using. Suppose you have this use case to handle. You need to create a travel page on the web, and on this travel page, you need to have two informations. First, the price of the travel, and you also want to add the weather forecast because it's nice to have for your customer. Well, if you want to create this kind of thing and you're comfortable with completable future, you will probably end up writing this kind of code, which is not that hard to write. It's not that easy to read neither. It's next to impossible to unit test and probably very hard to maintain also. And in fact, this code is a simplification of the real code that you need to write. Why? Because the problem you really want to deal with is this one. You don't want to query just one quotation server. You want to query more than one to get the best price. And the same for the weather forecast. So how can you do that? Well, you can add callbacks, within callbacks, within callbacks. Or you can use structured concurrency. I'm just going to show you the final patterns of code. This is the pattern you are going to use to query the quotation servers. You're just forking your tasks as callables. And if you need to query more servers, you just need to add one more line here. So and that's it. No more ugly callback. And once they've done their jobs, you just get the result from this scope object with this very simple pattern. And you return the best quotation and that's it. There are two important pieces in this scope object. The first one is the handling of the future objects that will get the results of the task you've launched, and this is the code. This is absolutely not asynchronous code. This is just regular code, imperative, synchronous, easy to read, easy to write, easy to maintain, easy to test. And with a little record pattern magic, you can even make it cleaner. And when your tasks are done, you just need to analyze the content of the quotations collection. And once again, super classical stream code to get the best quotation. Writing unit tests for these two methods is super easy. It's just regular, imperative, monothread code, no more callback. I'm not going to show you the code for the weather part because it's really the same. But let us write the code to build a travel page by querying the quotation servers and the weather forecast. In fact, it doesn't depend on the number of servers you are going to query. It's just super easy, super simple. And if you check this pattern, you will see that it's exactly the same as the previous one I just showed you. This travel page pattern just launches the first quotation scope that launches two more scopes, one for the quotations and another one for the weather forecast. Each scope launches virtual threads as needed. The nice thing that you have and that you did not have with the completable future pattern is that if your travel page scope is interrupted for one reason or another, it will automatically interrupt the quotation scope and the weather scope. A completable future pattern cannot do that in an easy way. So this structured concurrency pattern gives you more 
with a much better code, much easier to read, to write, to test, and to maintain, and also with better performances. So once again, if you want to take a look at that, and if you want to play with it, just check the JDK19, it's in preview in it. Let us now talk about the Valhalla project. I guess you've all heard about this design pattern book, that's the GOF, the Gang of Four. If you check the introduction of this Gang of Four, there is this well-known principle, favor object composition over class inheritance. Now the question is, why does nobody follow this principle? And why does nobody create wrapper classes to implement composition, like a city class that could just have a name, string of character, or a population class that could just wrap an integer? Well, there is a very good reason to that. Composition is expensive because it adds indirection, which means pointer chasing, and pointer chasing is expensive on modern CPU architectures. The first goal of Valhalla is to make it so that you do not have to choose between readable code and performances anymore. The idea is to make abstraction almost free. The motto is, codes like a class, works like an int. That's the motto of the Valhalla project. Valhalla brings several new notions. The first one is the notion of value class. What is a value class? Well, it's a class that is final, if you don't say so. It has instance fields that are also final, so it's basically an immutable class. Its instances do not have an address, so you will not be able to synchronize your code using an instance of a value class. And if you call equal code between two instances of value class, it will in fact compare the fields of your classes. And there's also this word constraint, but which is important. Its constructor does not call a constructor from a superclass. So record can be a very good candidate to be declared as a value record, and indeed records can be value classes. As you can see, creating such a class is very simple. It's basically a regular class with value declared in front of it. And because they do not need to be stored as object with an address, you do not need to follow a pointer to access the content of a value class. So basically, a value class is a class in your code, but it's not necessarily an object in the memory of your application. No pointer chasing to access instances of value classes. Instances of value classes can be stored in contiguous zones of your memory. You can put them in an array very efficiently, and they can easily be inlined in variables and even registered if needed. The second new notion brought by Valhalla, and we're going to see why they are two and not just one, is user-defined primitive types. A primitive type is a special kind of value class. As such, they do not have any identity. They do not have any address, so no identity. And in fact, it's just a sequence of field values without any headers or extra pointers. You know that an object in memory has a header, and in this header, there is a pointer to the class. There is information for the garbage collector. There is information for synchronization. All this is gone because you cannot perform any of this with primitive types. And once again, equal equal compares the field values. It does not compare the value of the references as it is the case for regular objects. And now for the tricky part. A reference to a primitive type cannot be null because a primitive type is something that cannot be null. You cannot say int i equal null, can you? It doesn't make any sense to do that. For user-defined primitive types, the default value is the value in which all the fields are set to their default value. So this is a primitive class called point. The fields are implicitly final, even if you do not declare them as final. You can have a constructor, and you can have any kind of method because it's still a class. And the following declares an array of new points. And because you cannot have null references to a primitive type, there are no null references in this array. If you read point of two, you will get the default value for the point primitive type. 
Now, suppose you put them in a list, and then you may be in trouble, because you can have no references in a list. You can always call list.add of null. So a list cannot be defined on a user-defined primitive type. In fact, this list will silently convert these primitive types to value types. And because you can have no references to value types, it will be okay to do that. So let us compare the different types of classes that we have in the Java language now. We have the regular classes that are called identity classes. We have value classes and we have primitive classes. Only primitive classes cannot have references. If you try to create an array of primitive types, it will be populated with the default values of the primitive types. Identity class and value classes are not tierable, and primitive classes are tierable under certain constraints. Tierability is what is happening when you try to move more bits at once than what your CPU supports. Suppose you are on the 32-bit CPU and you want to write a long, that is 64 bits, then you need two write operations to write this long. And if you can interrupt between the two write operations, then you may end up with a long in memory that has been only half initialized. This is what tierability is about. The boxing for identity classes and on value classes is not needed because they are object. For primitive types, you may have some operation that will convert instances of primitive classes to value classes. And we just saw one. Identity classes are not flattened in memory, meaning that in memory, what you get is a reference to some piece of memory heap, which is not the case for value or primitive classes. These are flattened in memory, at least on the stack, and if it's possible, also in a heap. There is an effort in the Valhalla project to create wrapper classes and to convert them to primitive classes. This is the case for the classical wrapper types, and that's the reason why you should not call the constructors of these wrapper classes anymore. If you check the source code of Integer, for instance, you will see that this constructor has been deprecated for removal, and it may be removed at some point in the future. The good news is that you can safely replace it with the value of factory method, which will give you exactly the same result. This pattern is the one you should be using now. There are also other classes that are good candidates to become primitive classes, among them optional and local date, and some other classes from the Java Date and Time API. Let us now quickly talk about the Panama project. And there are three elements in Panama that I would like to talk to you about. First of them is the Vector API, which brings parallel computing to the Java platform through the access of the single instruction, multiple data, SIMD, capabilities of your CPU. Then we have the foreign memory and foreign functions in Java. In a nutshell, the Vector API is about doing some vector and matrix computations in your application. You write your code in Java, using special classes that map the data types support by the SIMD part of your CPU. The nice thing is that it's really fully parallel computing. It gives you linear gain with the number of Cupidin calls in your SIMD kernel without having to rely on concurrent programming. This is much better than what you can do with parallel streams, for instance. The foreign memory API is a new API to deal with off-heap memory. If you want to work with the off-heap memory in a Java platform, you currently have this byte buffer class from Java and I.O., but it's limited to 2 gigabytes, and for some applications, it's not enough. You can also use JNI, which is an old API, not ideal neither, and you should definitely not use unsafe. So what is this foreign memory access API? that Panama is bringing. It's giving you several objects, memory segment, memory address, and memory layouts, which are all about dealing with contiguous regions of the memory outside of the heap. Memory segment shows and gives you a segment of memory. Memory address allows you to give references within this memory segment. 
and memory layout will describe how this memory segment is used and what kind of data you have put in it. By the way, these are nice sealed classes. You can check the source code if you want. Now, if you want to call foreign functions written in C, for instance, you can use the C-link instance. It can link a foreign function to a method handle, that is a Java object, so that you can call it from your Java code. And it also allows native code to call your Java methods, so it works in both directions. You have a function descriptor object to model the signature of a foreign function and a native symbol object that models the entry point of a function in a native library. It is bound to a resource scope object. And with this, I think we covered all the elements I wanted to show you. So thank you for your attention. Don't forget to check this slide deck for the links to the documentation of everything you saw after the last slides I just showed you. Thank you.